I'm going to talk about agile testing uh, because that's what I talk about, but relating to different contexts because I find that many organizations, well, every organization is different. So there's small companies, less than 100 people. There's really big companies, uh, ones that have 1,000, 5,000, 50,000. There's companies that are in different cities. Perhaps they're in uh, an hour apart, so the same time zone, but you can't stand up and walk and talk to your other people. There's ones that are of different time zones, so people here in Uruguay are talking to people in, I don't know, London. There's five hours or six hours difference, many times 13 or 14. Sometimes people are practicing agile, or what I've heard, agile-ish, right? They say they're doing agile, but they're not really doing agile. There's teams and organizations that are practicing continuous delivery or continuous deployment. There's teams and organizations that are still practicing uh, phased and gated, so waterfall, and that's okay too. There's so many contexts that when I hear people say, you must do it this way, I kind of look and I say, really? But my context won't work that way. So I'm hoping today to share uh, my experiences, what I have found works on different Agile teams, to show that you can use these ideas in any context and hopefully give you some practical ideas to share. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges that organizations face, um, how we think about testing, how we plan for testing, uh, and then how some of those, how can we adapt some of those contexts, some of those ideas, some of the practices to work across teams. And the last thing I want to kind of bring back is how we share. I have a grandson that continuously tells me sharing is caring. And so we'll talk about that. But let's start with some of the challenges. Agile. I've been working in Agile teams with Agile teams for just about 20 years. Isn't that scary? Yeah, it is very scary. Um, but it's sweet spot, it's ideal kind of idea, is small co-located teams, all sitting together in one place. How many here have that? Oh, look at this, a few, but definitely not everybody, right? That's its sweet spot. We have large organizations. I find that what I've been working with lately is those large global organizations. It usually means distributed teams. It means that I have teams in Uruguay, I have teams maybe in Romania, maybe in Australia, because the organizations are large. I find that I've been working with lots of banks, lots of insurance companies. They're very hard to get Agile in, right? So whatever your context is, try to apply what I'm saying today for that. Now, culture. One of the reasons I like to do what I do is the travel. Because I find when I go into different countries, I like to see their culture. So when I come to Uruguay, for example, I like to see how people react, how they interact. Organizations have a culture as well, right? It's defined by their values. Countries have values, so do organizations. Their norms, uh, what kind of things do they do all the time? Their social systems. 
How do they interact? Is all of their communication top down? Or do they have lots of side conversations? Those, uh, we call them water cooler conversations, you know, that people go talk and, and doesn't share. I often can tell a lot about an organization by its artifacts. What do they put on the walls? Do they put, you know, uh, some of those sayings that are supposed to inspire people but don't mean anything? Or, uh, for example, one organization I was with, it was a global organization, so they had an, in their boardroom uh, clocks with every place where they had customers so that we could see at any time where our customers, what time zone they were at. It just helped us think about our customers, right? Rituals. Do your teams go out? Do they interact with each other outside of work? Or do they stay in their little cubicles and never talk to each other? Even things like vocabulary, really important. Us versus them kind of idea, right? How do you use words? It's important. So I want to try a little experiment. Everybody stand up for a minute. This is a trick just to get you not falling asleep. Yeah. All right. So say hi to the person next to you. Just a quick hi. OK. Now, find somebody you don't know and introduce yourself. All right. Have a seat. Was it a lot easier just to say hi to somebody sitting next to you? Probably, right? Because there's no interaction. All of a sudden, when you had to introduce yourself, was that a little bit harder? Sometimes. Did you take the first initiative, or did you wait for the other person to take the initiative to introduce? These are some of the things we have to think about. When I travel to new countries, I, I go, do I shake your hand? Do I give you a kiss on the cheek? Do I, how do I introduce myself? It is different and I never quite know what to expect. So I try to watch when I'm in a new country to say, how do people interact? When I go into new organizations, again, I watch because those interactions are really important. Now, I find that organizational issues, when people say, yet yeah, agile doesn't work in my context, it's often because it's cultural. So, how do we interact? How do we introduce ourselves? But, how do we get our knowledge? Is it from above? So that, you know, the, the powers that be, the managers tell their managers and tell their managers and say, hey, can you do this? Or is it from the bottom up? Or is it somewhere in between? So I think it's really, really important to, to really understand how do we interact. Now, the other thing that I see quite often and I answered a question in the, in the round table last night, um, is the idea of the blame game. Melissa, why didn't you find that bug? How did it get out there, right? If we're in an organization that plays that blame game and says, it's your fault, your fault, people in the organization aren't going to try new things. They're not going to try to innovate. They're going to stay in their little place and do the very least amount of work that they can do. They don't want to be noticed. So culture plays a very big part. 
Some of the other things I see is in large organizations, for example, the bureaucracy, the red tape, I don't know the equivalent in Spanish, but it usually means lots of paperwork, right? Or I find that we've always done it this way, therefore we must continue to do this silly report telling you how many tests were run because we never think about doing it a different way. Right? I talked about the idea of, of hierarchy, orders coming from above. The other problem I see, and more so in large organizations, though I have seen it in small ones, is we're trying to do too many things at once. So we're trying to do 10 different projects all at the same time, but we only have two testers. So then we start to say, okay, you have to be on this project and that one and that one, and you have to be on this one and that one. It's setting us up for failure. Truly is setting us up for failure. This is not a testing problem, it is an organization problem. They don't know how to set their priorities, right? So start to look to see what is the issues. Is it a testing issue or is it something we have to dress differently? Now, a lot of people say, eh, we can't do Agile because we have too many government regulations. I've worked on teams that do medical devices, for example. They have lots, but they've learned how to make and simplify those, um, their governance. We work with a lot of third parties. We're just, Melissa and I were talking about that this morning. Dependencies. How do we work with other um, companies? So third parties can also mean different departments in your own company. And so really kind of look at what that is. Our customers are often in a completely different location. I um, had a product owner once, well our customers, I live in Canada, and our customers were in France. That's where our product owner was. And so we did a lot of, um, at the time we were using Skype, and I would choose a different tool now, but we did a lot of uh, interaction by being able to talk to each other. We had an eight hour time difference, but we did a lot of, I would come in in the morning and he would stay a little later. We showed and we interacted as much as we possibly could. And that's still around, it's easier because of technologies, but it's harder to understand what they want when they're not with you, right? Even the, the idea of the system integration. When you have a large organization, you usually have, I don't know, 15 different types of systems that you're integrating. How do you do that, right? These are all issues, especially given our fast delivery cycles that we're asking for. And there's many, many other issues that we try to do. Um, and very specific testing issues, like the idea of um, dependencies, or one of the risks I see is organizations, especially if you're small, it's easy. You walk next door and you ask. But when you're 50,000 people and you're trying to find out something, who do you ask? How do you find the answer, right? So there's lots of different specific testing issues that you have to be addressed. Now, usually when I get to this point, people start going, oh, too many things. We'll never make it. But I like to say, no, there's hope. There's hope. There's things we can do. So planning. In Agile, the value is not in the plan. It is in planning, right? Because we know it's going to change. We know we have to adjust. But we can start thinking about it. So I like to think about testing as a team problem, right? Um, how do we get people to start thinking about testing? How do we get 
our stories to be testable. And when we start having big systems, how do we know who tests what? These are planning issues, right? So in, in this diagram, if you have multiple teams, right? How do we think about our release cycle, our product release cycle? How do we plan for that? So I'm going to just show you a couple of tools that I found helpful when you have more than one team and for planning. So the first thing is a mind map, a testing mind map. If you have more than one team, get as many people from the different teams and start to brainstorm what kind of testing do we need. Maybe you start with your own team and say, hey, what kinds of testing do we need for this feature? And then extend it to other teams. How do we get that? So it's, it's the ideas in the planning. Another tool that I find um, helpful sometimes, it, it's uh, helpful for some teams, not for others, uh, but I always tell people to adjust, find something that would work for you. So this particular tool, when I um, walk out of a release planning meeting, when we're thinking about what we're going to do over time, I will take our features and put them down the left-hand side. So things like store customer information or add to shopping carts. These, these are not stories, they are features. I will take all the testers, uh, anybody else, domain experts, and then I start thinking about the testing types, testing ideas, uh, testing conditions. I don't care what you call them, but we think about things like uh, usability, look and feel is what I say up here, or calculations or localization. What do we have to test for this release? So now I have a, a, a spreadsheet that's just all white squares. And then I color, I gray out the ones that are not applicable. So in this example, it would say, um, for currency, store customer information, no currency, do not have to think about it. For me, once I finish that step, that is the value added. It's getting the teams to think about the kinds of testing they have to do. Now, the colors are used to show progress. So kind of a test coverage. But it's not exact, because it would be uh, what I call tummy feel. Testers saying, yeah, you know what? The usability for this feature, it's pretty good. Put a green sticker on it, right? So you can use it in many different ways. Now, those are just two tools that you can use to think about bigger picture, right? And that's what, really what we're trying to do. Now, levels of detail. What I find in many Agile teams is that they think story level. Everything's at the story level. And they forget about the feature a feature is the business capability. So features have many stories. Stories are what we implement. And then we have the task, which is the very low level. But they forget about how it integrates into the system, how it integrates into the bigger picture, how maybe we have to work with other teams. So we really need to be thinking about these levels all the time but also across teams when you're in a really large organization. The dependencies are truly important. Ideally, you've gotten rid of them all before you ever start. But in reality, I know that doesn't work. So sometimes it's a matter of getting up, walking over to the other team, saying, hey, we need something from you. Can we figure out how we're going to do this? Or picking up the phone and saying, how are we going to do this? 
One of the things I see instead of that is why haven't they given that to me, right? Don't do that. Go out and find the answer because that's really important. Try to figure out how to do it together. That's collaboration and that's really what we want to do is learn how to collaborate better. This is a kind of a scary picture. It's not too scary really, but if you start thinking about um, multiple teams, so, we have multiple teams. I can't reach that, so I can't show you. Sometimes my shadow will show. Um, but you have multiple teams. So, team A, B, C, and D. Ideally, they're integrating every day, every day, every day. But sometimes that's really hard when you're first starting. So, at the very least, you want to be thinking about how do we deliver um, an integrated product, at least at the end of every iteration, very least, when you start and work towards that continuous integration all the time. Now, sometimes we also have to think about these big systems and think about how do we plan for uh, economies of scale? How are we going to possibly uh, test every device? So sometimes we have test labs but then you have to think about, and the, the issues that arise is, if we have this team, that's the bottom green one, post-development testing, if we have that team and they find bugs, how do they report back to the other teams? Or do they have the skills to fix the bugs themselves? Lots of choices, lots of different things to think about. No one right way to do it. So, back to my original, testing is a team problem. But who's on your team? Do you know? I actually was in consulting uh, a company a couple of months ago, and when I went in and talked to one of the groups, and I'm going to call them a group, because I started saying, so which team? And these people did not know who their team was. They didn't know who their product owner was. And I went, oh, okay, let's go back, think again. So understanding who's on your team, but if you're in large organizations, it's way more difficult, right? Because you have you know, a regular team. This is my delivery team. It's the product owner, uh, tester, testers, Maybe some user experience people, maybe, well, you need programmers. Yeah, yeah they kind of have to be there. But you have a team. But then maybe you interact with a different team and you have dependencies. Maybe you have to interact with uh, the user experience team or the database team or some other team. Really understanding who is your extended family, right? So I, I sometimes say, your own family, right? The family you have now, you choose. But some of your family, you don't choose, right? Maybe it's a cousin, maybe it's a mother-in-law, maybe it's, but you still have to get along with those people. You still have to understand them. You have to know their needs and wants. So you really need to think about your extended family. Now, this is the same picture as before, but I've added one extra bright green line. So I've added performance testing as an example because maybe you have a very specific performance testing team. They're part of your extended family. The agile teams are the ones still responsible for making sure that testing gets done, even if you're using a third-party team, right? So really understand how you're working together because it's really important to do that. 
Now, the other thing that I see is we assume many things. So explicit versus implicit needs, right? Who's thinking about that strategy at the big level? Who's uh, thinking about, are you testing this? Or are you testing this? Right, so I've got a picture of the automation test pyramid here because I like to use models. I don't care if you use this model or a different model, but when I'm talking about the uh, automation, for example, I like to get my team in the room to say, we have this feature, and draw a picture of the pyramid and say, all right, what kinds of tests do we have to do? What level do they belong at? Who's going to be responsible? How are we as a team doing this? It's not a matter of saying this is how it's being done. It's to generate a conversation to say, how are we going to accomplish this? So no matter what your context, use simple models to help drive that conversation because that is what's important. Same with tools and practices, right? The larger the organization, the more variety you're going to have. But if you've got several teams working on the same product, you're going to want to think about how do we coordinate those tools and practices. Uh, especially when you're doing things like continuous delivery. It becomes very important. So you can't possibly have every team using different version control, right? Because you're trying to get continuous integration. Uh, so you want to be able to understand. And from a testing perspective, that means thinking about how does the branching work? How does the merging work? How do we test for those risks? Do we know our test environments? Do we know what we're testing in which environment? Right? So it's really important to be able to have these conversations, to be able to really think about what it means to you. Now, we're going to get into some of the, the um, real practices. These are things that you can take home, I hope, or take back to your company, right? So quite often what I find is people say, we can't do Agile because we can't do all that automation because we can't, we can't, we can't. Instead, start thinking about what can we do to make it happen? Do we have to change our architecture to make it more testable so that we can automate? It won't happen all at once. Um, I worked with a company once that we, uh, we had really bad quality. Our customers were quite angry. And so we stopped and we said, what do we need to do? So we started thinking about it and we started uh, taking our legacy system and the programmers said, every time we add a new feature and we touch our legacy system, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, refactor. We're going to add unit tests and we're going to refactor. And then we'll add the new feature. So that's what they did. So small chunks, little by little by little. It took quite a while definitely more than a year, and I know that some of you will have much bigger systems than that one was, but start. What is it going to take? Small chunks. Everything about Agile is how can we break it down, and this includes testing, to make it testable, right? So things like regulatory. Ask yourself, instead of doing all that paperwork, how can we make it simpler? How can we simplify what we do? Is there a way to automate? 
What is necessary artifacts? Is there a way we can generate those rather than making us do more work? How can we work with third parties? Hey, can I, can I take and talk with you about how we might do testing together? Right? So third parties. How do we remove those dependencies or at least get fast feedback loops? So those feedback loops are probably the most important thing, especially in the continuous delivery, right? We want to be thinking about how do we talk? How do we get that feedback loop faster? Automation helps. But having those conversations to remove those assumptions is the first step. So acceptance test driven development, you may have heard it called um, behavioral driven development, BDD, right? Whatever term you use, you start with a feature. You um, might have examples, you slice that feature into stories, into user stories, you explore that user story, more examples, the conversation is what's important. And then, of course, all the magic happens. You go in, you code, you test, and hopefully you have a really good story, right? But all the time, fixing defects. Now, if you fix those defects before code happens, you're preventing them from having to be reworked in the code. So ask questions before you ever start. And the idea is, is that the story is accepted and you move on to the next story. Acceptance test driven development means we're starting with the test first, right? So tests, examples, when I say examples, I mean concrete examples, right? Because that's what shares understanding. So if I'm talking to, uh, so if I'm in Canada and speaking English and I'm talking to somebody speaking Spanish, there's lots of room for misinterpretation. But if I give you an example, it removes a lot of that misinterpretation. So let's take a, a function to add two numbers. Pretty simple, isn't it? I want to add two numbers and get a, a thing. So let's, let's do a test. 2 plus 1 equals 3. Everybody get that? Can you go code that? Yeah, I can go code that. But if I give you another example and say 2.0 plus 1 equals 3.0, are you going to have more questions now? Ah, oh, yeah. Maybe we have to start asking questions, how many decimal places do we want to show? How many decimal places do we keep? What are we trying? And it will spur, it will generate more questions. If we explore another example, all of a sudden we're going to start asking, do we need to show those trailing zeros? Is that important? It might be if you're doing exchange rates, for example, you want to start thinking about what are the different examples we can use to explore. So, minus 2 plus 1 equals minus 1. Questions that might come out of that would say, how do we want to express the negative numbers? Do we want to express them like this? Maybe in brackets? Maybe in red? Lots of different ways. All of a sudden, that function adding two numbers together becomes much more clear. Examples and tests can remove that understanding or misunderstanding, sorry. All right, um, drawing pictures, asking questions. Those are ways to really get that understanding and that's no matter what context you're in is going to happen, those misunderstandings. I have the power of three on here. Um, power of three is like the three amigos idea, 
but having different domains, so a domain expert, a tester, a programmer, in the conversation about any given story. It's really important to have that. With, when I have, um, especially when I have global teams, distributed teams, I find that if I have a conversation, I want to capture the most important things and put them in writing. Now, writing doesn't necessarily mean uh, a paragraph. It might be examples, because those examples, those tests, take all the misinformation away. What else can you do? Share. Share your desktop. You do not have to be in the same room. Better. It's much better if you're in the same room. But if you're not, then try to figure it out. Exploratory testing is an amazing tool. So, or approach is a better word, not a tool. Um, use it, but don't keep it to yourself. Share it. So, I pair, I like to pair with people when I explore because two pairs of eyes, you'll see different things. But you can explore in groups as well. Uh, mob testing, for example. But look at different ways you can approach your application. How are you going to do it at a feature level, but also at a system level? Right? Really think about what makes sense. Try different things. Again, I repeat, testing is not a tester's problem. It is a team problem. So really think about who's on your team to get that fast feedback. Understand what that means. Now, the very last piece, sharing is caring. But I'm talking about information. So how do you share your information? Because that is what's important, the visibility. I talk about drawing pictures or showing examples. It's all about making it visible. Because if your team knows it's visible, then they can start helping. If you're hiding it and protecting it, it's not doing anybody any good. So share, right? It's much harder to keep secrets and hide information when you're sharing it and telling the world about it. Now, that's not always easy, especially if you're on distributed teams, but really think about how can we make it visible? Because that's what's important. The power behind Agile in any form is its transparency really is, but sometimes that's the very hardest part because people cannot hide. But if we all have the same goal, then the team themselves can really make a difference in how they work, how they share. And the extended family, once again, don't forget them, the extended family. So this is a picture. Uh, so Lisa Crispin, my co-author of our books, uh, they were trying to do something. They had some remote team members, and they wanted to do some, uh, I don't know what they were doing, mapping, drawing, something. So they had to try to figure out how to get a webcam to look not at the audience, but at the whiteboard. And so they did some tricky things, but they finally got it to work so the remote team member could be part of the conversation. So you want to think about no, those sorts of things. How do you make the people real who are somewhere else? So putting avatars in your, in your uh, uh, tool, whatever you may be using, is one way. Uh, I heard a story the other day that they were having trouble trying to figure out their other team members who were away. Uh, at a different location. So they started every stand-up. They made a decision as a team that they were going to start every stand-up, so they took turns. 
So they'd start and they'd say, hello, I'm Janet. The thing I want to share with you today is I am going to a competition for my granddaughter on the weekend. Short, sweet, simple. But what that allowed and what they found was that simple sharing of personal information allowed other people to say, huh, I have a, a daughter in com competitive sports. What is your granddaughter in? And all of a sudden, conversations started happening. People started connecting. And it's all about people. It's all about people connecting. So think about what you can do because when you have a connection, then you can start asking questions about testing. It makes it much simpler. Communities of practice is another way to really help. So you have an amazing community of practice right here. I've been talking to Claudia a lot about how they've been uh, reaching out and working with other organizations and other teams and other countries. Use that um, in your own organization. Develop a community of practice. What are we doing in our organization for testing? What can I learn from other people? But extend it because right now you have an amazing group of people. So just a couple of last things to leave you with. It's all about adapting, right? It's all about where am I, where is our team, what can we do to make our life better, right? And you can't do it alone. If everybody is working on their own, you're just going to collide. So how can you use your strengths, because I do think everybody has strengths, right? How can you use your strengths to work together to create that team? Now, just a final note. Um, I don't like distributed teams. I really try to encourage teams to be in the same location. I don't advocate outsourcing or any of those other things. But if you have those problems, I'm really hoping that some of the things I talked about today can really help, right? So I'll leave you with that. I encourage people to email me. Uh, there's this. Um, I encourage people to, of course, read my books because that's, yeah. But uh, there's references, lots of reading materials to talk about and to read. Uh, and I'm just going to leave it here, and we have time for questions, right? Okay, so, but I have to put my headphones on in case anybody speaks in Spanish. Hi, uh, thanks for, for your talk, it was very helpful. Can you tell us, tell us about one of the you know, most important challenges or hardest challenges you faced and how you resolved them? We know not, you know, the lots the, of difficult. <laughs> the hardest challenge I face uh, in any particular context with a client or something like that. I, I think the hardest thing, and there's probably lots of them, um, is getting the clients to understand that the problem usually isn't the testers. So when I get a phone call and they say, we would like to have you come in and work with our team, and the phone call is usually something like, can you come and fix our testers? Now, the reason they ask that is because the testers aren't keeping up. And when I go in, I realize that it's not the testing that can't keep up, it's the rest of the team that hasn't adjusted the way they've worked. So quite often, the hardest thing is convincing the organization or the teams that it's not a testing problem. The problem is that um, the stories are too big or that the stories 
are not testable, that they come in components. So an example would be when I was in a, a company and we were working at, um, the problem was that the testers weren't giving them fast enough feedback. We had a retrospective and that was the number one problem. Testers were not giving the fast enough feedback. So when I started digging in and looking, what was happening was the programmers were doing things like, the first story was do all of the configuration. The second story was create the database tables and then the database access tables. So the testers couldn't test anything until about five or six stories were completed. So we then had to solve that was we sliced the stories differently. But it meant that the developers had to change how they were doing their work. To do that, um, we kept going back to what the problem was. What is the problem? Because when you do things like that, it's not about making it better for the testers or for the programmers or for the product owner. It's about being better for the team. So I think one of the hardest problems is really um, showing that the problem is not in the testing. It's in how we're doing our work, period. Um, so there's a lot of those kinds of things that I see. Next question. Hello. Hello. Morning. Well, um, I have a question about, or, or more a request for a suggestion on how to proceed. Uh, in my case, I have a distributed team on yes. the client side, of course. <laughs> and there's one rock star developer who wants to, of course, uh, she's a really good one, but uh, in the in the need of fast uh, development, uh, it's also fast bugging. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of difficult sometimes to make them understand the need of, of course, we want things happen quickly, but yeah. please, <laughs> not has, that quickly. Yeah. Yeah, we, we want to do it with quality. Yes, right? with quality. With the, there's a need, I think, in my mind. There's a need for them to show uh, the, their, their moves. So yes. it's, we have to take uh, another approach or something. Yeah, so one of the things that I found works with some of those people, not all of them, um, but I've had some success with taking and kind of like what I was doing with the, the one plus one kind of idea mm -hmm. is talking about examples with the programmer before they start coding. Um, even if I take and write down all of those things and take it to the programmer to say, this is what I'm going to test, hopefully before they start coding um, and have that discussion with them, all of a sudden they stop a little bit and, and go, oh, I never thought about this. And um, I've had different people say to me, but if I show my test to the programmer, then they're just going to program the, to make the test pass. And I go, if I have a good programmer, it doesn't matter. They're going to think about other things. A good programmer, it doesn't matter. A bad programmer, ones that create lots of bugs, the code is so much better, no matter what. So it's a win. Um, so sometimes I found that helps. Um, it takes that hero idea down a notch, and hopefully they start giving better code. So that's one suggestion. Thank you. Hello. Hello. You talk about dependencies. Yes. And uh, you know, with dependencies uh, for distributed teams, you have big teams are a complete mess. So, <laughs> yeah, they are. Uh, even when you have a, a good relationship with the different teams, um, you have uh, prioritized uh, tasks. So maybe you need something of other teams, but uh, they, uh, they are not a, pro a priority to. Right, so, so. and so when I was talking about many of the problems are a cultural problem 
and often too many projects. That's exactly what's kind of happening in there because what I see is different teams have different priorities. So an organizational culture change that I would, that I try to get happen is to come from one place. How, what is the most important thing for this company? It's this feature. We need to get this feature out, which means that every team that is working on this feature has the same priority. And there's a way that they're going to figure it out. But if they don't have that common goal from an organizational perspective, then this product owner is going to say, well, this feature's not important for me. I'm doing it way over here, right? So it comes back down to the organizational goal to say, what is the most important thing so that we all can work on it? And then you can have a reasonable discussion about the dependencies. Harder, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger problem, it really is. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I was working with a team just a couple of weeks ago, and they were doing their release planning, and for the first time, they tried something new. They went into a big room, and on a wall probably this size, they had five, six different teams, and they had their iterations, they were planning, and they had their story cards on big index cards, and they started mapping out. And they, they mapped out which team was dependent on which other team for a feature. And it made them visualize what, what the dependencies looked like. And all of a sudden, they realized that we thought we could do this stuff in two months, but because of the dependencies, it's going to take us four. So making it visible tries anything like that as well. Okay. Time for one more question, I think. Maybe two. Hello. Hello. Um, so I wanted to know your thoughts on these new types of teams that actually ask everyone to be able to jump in on everything, like developers maybe helping out on testing and testers, I don't know, doing a code review? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I, I talked about everybody having strengths, right? So testers have specific strengths. We're question askers. We have critical, we, we critique everything. You know, it's, what if we do this? That's a, a strength that we have. But I believe that on uh, agile teams, we blur the lines, right? I don't stand in my box and say, I am a tester and I can't do anything. So if a task, if I know how to read code, if I know how um, basic, basic uh, coding constructs, um, if I know our coding standards, I can peer review. I can sit with a programmer and say, walk me through your code. They will find most of their own mistakes. But I can say, why is this method 50 lines long? Our standards say we're not supposed to have anything over 20 or 10. I can ask questions like that. I can ask questions like, why are we doing it this way? It seems complicated. All right, so if I have those skills, I can do things like that, right? Um, and it sometimes makes me a better tester because I understand more of the risks around the coding. I also think, and if any programmer tells you they can't test because they're a programmer, they lie. Do I have any programmers in the room? Yay! They're, they're lying if they say they can't test. They can. But you have to remember that when they're coding, they're at a very low level. And it's sometimes very difficult to look at the big picture of your whole uh, system. And that's where testers really come in. So can programmers test? Absolutely. Um, a story that um, Lisa Crispin, my co-author, tells is that in her last team, she was the only tester, and there was a number of teams she was supporting. So she trained the programmers to do exploratory testing. Not that they were experts at it, but they could do enough 
to find some of the bugs because she was the bottleneck and their team was getting stuck. So all of a sudden their, their programmers took a lot of the ownership of some of the testing. Didn't mean that they necessarily tested their own stuff. They might have tested somebody else's. So it's a matter of testing is a team problem. How can we work together to make it happen?